welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. Worship is always important. It's going to be of particular importance at camp this year because we will be flowing with God, meeting with God. And sometimes we can lose sight of some of the things that God has taught us about worship, and then the worship doesn't quite hit the mark in the way that it could. Here in Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2, Surely God is my salvation, I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Uh, This helps us to understand that worship is not an activity. The Lord himself is our song. And as you know, when we had that major breakthrough in worship some years ago now, some ten years or so ago, God redefined worship for us. I think that's the only way that you can put it. And we just need to get back to that redefinition. If you remember those, well, those few of you who were here then, the rest of you probably heard about it at some time. We were at that time flowing very much in what you would call charismatic worship. We actually had a very good music group and worship leaders at that time. And uh, the Lord stopped me short, as he has the habit of doing every now and again, saying, I want to teach you to worship. Now, this was another time when the Lord offended me, (laughs) as he has the habit of doing. And, you know, on the one hand, you feel like saying... uh, what do you think we're doing now, Lord? But as that's not the way to talk to God, you say, what are you saying, Lord? (laughs) And what he told us was to stop doing everything that we were then doing, and he would teach us. I remember going to the worship team and telling them this. They were absolutely flummoxed because all their security was about to be taken away from them. So they said, well, what does this mean? I said, well, at present we have a band up on the platform, so we won't have a band up on the platform. Uh, We sing songs, so we won't sing any songs. Uh, God says the Spirit is going to give us our worship, so we'll let him do that. And for three weeks we never had any instruments. We didn't uh, sing any songs. We just let the Spirit lead us. And it's no exaggeration to say we were in a completely different place with God in our worship as a result of that. And what God taught us, well, he he reinforced other things he'd taught us before, but what he taught us in in that time is that no band or no people on the platform should ever lead worship. Uh, We've got back to that a little bit. But he taught us that that should not be the case, that the Holy Spirit should always lead the worship. And the band and instrumentalists and people on the platform are there to accompany what the Spirit is doing, not to lead what the Spirit is doing. And those of you who are here, remember that he taught us that each one of us, as we worship, has the responsibility to be led by the Spirit. That the purpose of the musicians is not to cause us to worship, not to inspire us to worship. That inspiration has to come from within each one of us. It's not their job to do that. Their job is much more one of coordination, of just being able to draw what the Spirit of, of God is doing individuals together 
I'll talk more about that in a minute. Let's go to uh, John, John's Gospel, chapter 4, what Jesus says about worship. Again, just to remind us, This means, of course, we're never dependent upon musicians. You're never dependent upon anybody else to lead you. Every time you come in here at 8 o'clock or anywhere else for that matter, you have to make the decision that you are going to give of yourself to the f- in the fullest possible way to the Lord in worship. It's not for the musicians or anybody else to try to pump it up or ramp up the worship or anything like that. It's entirely your motivation from your heart. And this is endorsed by what Jesus says. Um, He's talking to the Samaritan woman. And uh, he says in verse 23, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Now, this is the key phrase. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. What, what the Father is seeking is not worship, but worshippers. I don't actually like the phrase worship leader. We, we use it as a bit of shorthand. But really the only worship leader is the Holy Spirit. And we are the worshippers. You know, we talk about having a worship group, but actually all of us are the worship group. Hello. We stick some people up on the platform, but we're all the choir. Mm -hmm. You will be in the heavenly choir, which means that your voices, for some of you, will certainly have improved by the time that happens. But even now, you know, there is nothing imperfect in heaven, so it doesn't matter what your voice sounds like in here, by the time it reaches the heavenly ear, it will have been perfected. Is that good news or is that good news? So God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and truth. Now, to worship in spirit means that the Holy Spirit is giving you the worship. You remember Paul says that we don't even know how to pray as we should, but the Holy Spirit prays for us. The Holy Spirit gives us, if you like, the prayer. We are incapable of worshipping God. That's the first thing you have to understand. I cannot worship the Lord. I do not have it within me as a person to adequately worship God. So he has put his spirit within me, But if I trust in the Holy Spirit, the Spirit will glorify God and enable me to worship Him. Hello. Now, if you don't get that, all you would do is stand there and sing songs. And I'm fed up with singing songs, and I'm fed up with singing the same old songs again and again and again. God forgive us for not having new songs in these last few months because it's not glorifying to Him. I mean, he must, if I'm bored, he certainly is bored with hearing the same stuff again and again and again. And I mean, it, that is not the spirit of worship. It's not the heart of worship. It's why the scripture says, sing unto the Lord a new song. And that comes from the Psalms before tongues was given to the church. Amen. The Holy Spirit is cre- the creator spirit. He's always willing to create new things. And that's why, you know, rather than just sing that, that, here we go again, song, uh, that we allow the Holy Spirit to be giving us new songs all the time. Both in English and, and, and tongues. But we'll come on to that in a minute. Let's turn to Revelation because... Real worship is focused on the throne. I had an interesting experience this, this weekend, and, and we had some good conversation with the pastor about it, both before and after the event. Because on the teaching day on, on Saturday, we had some absolutely tremendous worship. 
And he was explaining to me they wouldn't worship in quite the same way. They'd be using different kinds of songs and so on because really they wanted the worship to be more user-friendly, you know, especially for non-believers. So they sang other songs, including some hill songs and stuff with a lot of I this and I that, singing about how we felt about the Lord and so on. And there just wasn't the same anointing. There wasn't the same sense of the presence of God. They tried to... I think they tried to make it more than it it was. Whereas the whole thing just flowed so naturally on the Saturday morning. And I mean, if if anybody, whether they were believer or not, came into Saturday, they would have had a completely different experience of worship than on the Sunday. So we had an interesting little conversation about that as well. Why? Because all true worship is focused on the throne and the one who sits on the throne. It's not so much a question of singing to the Lord, but we are glorifying the Lord. So, in... uh, and, And what the Lord has taught us, hasn't he, is that our model for worship is revelation. Why? Because revelation gives us the... um, an insight into what the worship in heaven is like. And whatever happens in heaven is in the spirit. That is spiritual worship. So it's not all tongues, but worship in the spirit is focused on the Lord. I mean, and Jesus taught us to pray, may your will, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, What does God want on earth? He wants the same kind of worship as there is in heaven. So everything is focused on the Lord. In chapter 4, verse 8, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Verse 11, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Uh, In uh, chapter 5, verse 12, in a loud voice they sang. And remember, it's all loud in heaven. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard... uh, Every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. So, you know, even in heaven they're saying Amen to the worship that um, we are offering to the Lord here. If you go on to chapter 7, verse 10, and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They fell down on their faces, verse 11, before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. And so on, we could go on. It's all the same, all the way through Revelation. Now, this is properly worship, because worship means worship, giving God what he is worth. Now, the scripture does talk about singing songs, spiritual songs to one another. And if you look at the Psalms, there is a place for singing um, in even putting prayer in song. Uh, There is a place for proclamation. There is a place for affirmation. There's a place where we really get militant uh, in what we're proclaiming in song. It's all part of spiritual victory, spiritual warfare, spiritual victory that we have. Praise of God is a very important part of that because the enemy flees wherever there's praise. But we must understand that all that is not properly worship. 
There is a difference between praise and worship, and it's got nothing to do with how loud the song is. Uh, worship is precisely that. It's focusing on God. Actually, it's difficult to say there's a difference between praise and worship because when you read the book of Revelation, those two words are used um, to signify the same thing. They worship God and say, praise be to God. But just for the sake of of, uh, explanation, we can make this distinction that when we're worshipping, we're really focused on the throne. I think it's better to say at other times we're proclaiming things about God. But remember, one of the things that he taught us was that you worship what you sing about. And the reason why I take exception to so many of these songs that are popular today is people are singing about their experience rather than about God. So they're worshipping their experience of God rather than worshipping God. And there's a very, very big and significant difference in that. And the effect uh, is markedly different. Like uh, I was explaining at the weekend, because when when you focus on the Lord, if you sing a song and whatever goes on in between, we'll come to that in a minute. But when you're focused on the Lord, you see what should happen in any time of worship is you build you get higher and higher. You're building because everything is focused on the Lord. In between the songs, you're still focusing on the Lord. You're still singing to Him. But we're not dependent at the end of a song, as, as we well know, on anybody up here leading you know, either an affirmation or, or an ascription of praise to God. You have the Spirit and you sing, both in tongues and in English or, or your own first language. And if you're really worshipping in the Spirit, then it will be prophetic in the sense that the Holy Spirit will enable the worship and He will actually give you the words in your own language as well as in tongues. So what should happen is you're singing in tongues and you flow into English, back into tongues, flow into English, back into tongues, flow into English. At certain times, once the thing has really built up, then sometimes God does give to someone a, either a prophetic song or an ascription of praise to God, which we all sing a few times. But that's not a device. That should be something that expresses what God is already doing, what, you know, we've arrived at that point where we just bring everything together because everybody is actually in that place of worship. Now, let's talk about, this is oversimplifying it, but the three places in the temple because this helps us to understand the three different types of praise for God. There is the outer court, the middle court, and the inner court, the inner sanctuary, which is the Holy of Holies. In the outer court, you can sing and rejoice in the Lord. You can dance. You can be happy and clap happy and whatever. It's a place of rejoicing. It's a place of of exalting God, but... You know, this is where we, boom, we can sing our proclamation songs as well. Um, the shindig at camp is very much out of court worship. <laughs> um, but then, by then, we've been in the middle and the inner sanctuary, so it's good just to let our hair down and have a rejoicing time. But that's, that's the outer court where everybody can just be free to express themselves. And God does like to see freedom in that place. Amen? You know, there are some people that sort of stand there like stiff 
broomsticks and saying, I'm free. And right. they're about the only person that believes it. That's it. <laughs> because you've only got to look at them to see that they're not free. That's right. That uh, they wouldn't know how to rejoice. Mm. Or if they do, they only do it on their own, which means they're still not free That's right. to do it when anybody else is around. So, you know, you can have a good... And, and you shouldn't wait, whether it's here or on the NRC, to be invited when we're having a rejoicing time to come out of your seat, seat and dance. I mean, it should be automatic. Yeah, I don't want to stay within the restriction of the rows of chairs. I want to get out and express real joy and freedom in Jesus because he has set me free. Then there's the middle court. Now, in the middle court, that's where the focus begins to get on the Lord. And you are aware of his presence. Most charismatic worship gets to the middle court, but seldom into the inner court. And often we've been stuck in the middle court recently. It's not good news, which is why the Lord's talking to us about this this morning. Uh, Because to know that the Lord is present isn't all that helpful, actually. Because what we need to do is to get into a place where we meet with him. Uh, In the Holy of Holies. And it took the death of Jesus on the cross to open up the Holy of Holies to us so that we can move from the holy place into the Holy of Holies. So the middle court is the holy place. Therefore, you know the presence of God. And that's nice. That's good. Nice to know that we're in his presence. Good to feel the sense of the presence of the Lord. But, um, you know, I use... (coughs) used this illustration before, supposing the, the Queen was to visit us in the NRC for a service and we would sit her in the front row somewhere, everybody would be in her presence and everybody would know that she was there. Uh, no doubt some would be looking to see whether she raised her hands in worship or not. But everybody would know that they were in the presence of the Queen. But that doesn't mean that everybody there would meet her. You can be in the Lord's presence without meeting with him. You can know the Lord is in the house without meeting with him. You can know he's manifesting his presence without meeting with him. So it's good to be in the holy place. That's where... people begin to focus on the Lord's presence. Of course, I mean, it's not not the case here, but the problem, you can go to so many different churches and actually the, the people that are trying to lead the worship have never really been taught how to do that. And they, you have an outer court song, a middle court song, back to the outer court and the middle court, and you go nowhere. Nothing actually builds. So we, we need to move all the time because I believe God's purpose every time we worship is to take us into the Holy of Holies. I mean, if it cost his blood to make that possible, I believe God wants us to do it, not just to know it's possible. Now, what's the difference between the inner court and the middle court? When you're in the inner court, you forget that anybody else is there. You wouldn't actually have the foggiest idea what others are doing. Whether they're standing, sitting, kneeling on their faces, whether they're singing in tongues, singing a song, whether you know the song, whether you don't, you are just totally taken up with God. Uh, 
There have been times we need to get back to these times. I mean, it used to be a regular thing where um, people in the congregation, not, not just here in Rafi, but Sundays too, people in the congregation didn't even realize the band had stopped playing because everybody on the platform was on their faces. But because people weren't following the band, just because the band stopped didn't mean the people stopped because right. everybody is engaged with God. Now, I can remember sometimes, you know, being in those times of worship and I think, right, it would just be good to sing a particular song at that moment. And I look around and there's not a musician in sight because they're all on their faces. So say, okay, Lord, we'll just flow on as we are now. Um, why? Because what we're there to do is to meet with God. And I'll just remind the musicians, because they've been told this before, if you're not worshipping, stop playing your instrument till you are. Nothing is worse than seeing people up on a platform mindlessly strumming a guitar or whatever and they look as just about as far removed from what is actually going on as it's possible to appear. Now when people are in the inner sanctuary of God's holiness it's not like that. It's good to see the Musicians rejoicing when we're rejoicing. But um, some of you have just forgotten, some of you instrumentalists have just forgotten that. You stop playing until you're worshipping, then you can start playing again. Because worshipping isn't about playing your instrument. Worshipping is about your heart. If your heart isn't engaged with God, stop what you're doing, get your heart engaged yeah. with God, then you can pick up your instrument again. Are we there? Yeah. Makes all the difference for you. And uh, the great thing is that we want people, we want, I mean, we really desire, because God desires this worship in spirit and truth, desires his people to be engaged with him heart to heart, yeah. spirit to spirit. Are we there? So it doesn't matter if all the instruments stop playing because the people will go on worshipping. And I say, you know, at times like that, and sometimes, you know, the worship's gone on. Well, there have been times it's gone on for two or three hours. Yep. We have a bit of restriction on our services these days, so that's not possible. But uh, except when we have conferences and things like that. But, you know, I can remember times, can't, some of you would too, where the preacher hasn't been able to preach because the presence of God was so strong in the worship, you could not stop the worship. I mean, I can remember we had a famous preacher from America. And, you know, you think we paid this guy's airfare and he can't even get on the platform. <laughs> um, I can remember the particular night this man was visiting. Never mind who it was. Uh, he was in the front row. Fortunately, he was a worshipper. So, um, you know, he was really participating in what was going on. And after about two hours, I thought, I, I don't know how we're going to get this guy on tonight. I mean, the presence of God was just so thick and most people are on their faces before God and all the rest. So uh, I, I finally came down from the platform while the worship was going on and, and said to this guy, look, when there's a gap, just get up there and preach. Or go up there now and wait. Just wait as soon as there's a gap and jump in. So anyway, he went up and he stood behind the pulpit for an hour. And we just went on worshipping for another hour. That meant we'd been going for about three hours. At the end of that time, he, when he could finally speak, 
realized that it was not really the occasion for a major preach. So he just shared a little bit of testimony. Nothing very much at all. I mean, it was very sort of low-key, laid-back stuff. Had an altar call for salvation and 25 people came forward and gave their lives to the Lord. Now, you would have said there was nothing evangelistic about that and three hours of worship like that for unsaved people? If I remember rightly, I think it was 27 people came forward to give their lives to the Lord that night. There were obviously, because he was a well-known guy, there were a lot of people there that wouldn't otherwise normally have been there. But it just shows you how evangelistic worship can be. Because, you see, that would not be the kind of thing that you would, if you think you need user-friendly worship, you wouldn't do that kind of thing, would you? And, I mean, there's, there's been many times at camp where we allow, of course, we've got time there, Nobody's got anything to do except go back to their cold, damp tents. Or, I mean, beautiful, hot, steamy tents. So they're quite happy to stay there worshipping the Lord for as long as. But I, I can remember another occasion when, uh, I think it must have been in one of our conferences, I can't remember. Anyway, it was, we were in the... NRC and the band could not stop playing. They could not stop. Um, they went on for three hours, and I could, and remember I had a look at the keyboard. The keyboard was actually covered with blood because the fingers of the keyboard player had gone raw. People had been strumming their guitars. And the following day, all their fingers were fine. But they just, on that occasion, they weren't on their faces. They just could physically not stop. The spirit of worship just came upon people. And it wasn't all songs. It was very few songs. Just worshipping God in the spirit. Now, we don't want to look back to former times. But sometimes, like reading books on revival, they are an encouragement to us to know what God is able to do, what God is willing to do. And we realize we need to get our focus back where worship does not just become an activity that goes on for a period of time, either here or wherever else. But worship is the God-given gift that enables us to draw near right into the Holy of Holies and meet with God in his holiness, his majesty, and his glory. Now, I believe the reason why God has laid this on my heart, we're going to get and worship him in a minute, is because he wants to reveal more of his majesty and his glory. And I believe at camp there is going to be a tremendous revelation of God. It's going to be a life-changing and a nation-changing thing, not because we're praying for the nation or focus on the nation but because our focus is on God and God is going to give us something God is going to do something that will be so powerful that it will impact the nation you know there's many things happening at present to divert people's attention away from God one is to get on a plane and go to Florida which is to me just about the biggest sign of unbelief that there could be in the church. I mean, how can you have Christ in you and think you've got to go to Florida to meet with him? Hello? I mean, either you don't believe you've got Christ in you. If That's right. Preach it. It's, it just doesn't make any kind of sense. No sense at all. 
people only gave the money to Kingdom Faith that they would have spent on their airfare and got before God, used the time, you know, to fly there, just to get before God and meet with God. Something would happen to impact their lives far more than going off and seeing what God is doing somewhere else, which will bless them and the blessing will last for two or three weeks and then it will just be a memory. So never mind what God is doing anywhere else. The only thing that matters is what God is doing here. And the only thing that matters at camp is what God is doing at camp. You know, people get on planes and say, oh, I want an impartation. Why? Haven't you got an impartation? Haven't you got the anointing from the Holy One? Doesn't Christ live in you? What impartation are you looking for that you don't already have? Hello? You say, well, there's some miracles happening. There'll be miracles happening at camp. Let me tell you, more miracles will happen at camp than you'll see on a program from Florida. Why? Because people are going to meet with God. You might not see all the miracles, but that doesn't matter. The people will receive them, and God will be working them. Because when you get people into that, holy of holies before God. All manner of things, not just healings, but all manner of things happen to people. Why? Because they're meeting with God. God himself is touching their lives. So all of us, you musicians need something new from God before camp. All of us need need to get into a new place in our worship. Because it's doesn't work that we think, okay, well, it'll all be good at camp. No, it's got to be good before camp. So we're taking something into camp. And what we have just gets released among the people. So this is not radical new stuff. It's stuff you all know. And it's just putting it all together. Because we should never need anybody here or on Sunday to stand on the platform and encourage us to worship. So, you've got the inner motivation in your own heart to give all the glory, the honor and the praise to God. Haven't you? Yes. If not, then you need to get your heart sorted out before the Lord. Let's all stand then, shall we? We won't have the musicians because we're going to worship. Not follow the musicians. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, lead us. We yield ourselves to you, Lord. We recognize that we cannot worship in and of ourselves. That apart from you, we can do nothing. But we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the spirit of worship. And thank you that you enable us to worship in spirit and truth. So, Lord, I yield myself to you now. I yield myself to you, Holy Spirit. Just inspire that worship. Work that worship. Give me the worship that will glorify my Father and my Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.